الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبيك الكريم وبعد رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي like to welcome everyone to today's uh, lecture, inshallah. This is our crude online lecture, and I'd like to share a few words with you today regarding the importance of the fast and uh, some of the activity that we are encouraged to participate in during the whole month of Ramadan and uh, we'll, at the end, inshallah, answer some questions regarding some of the rulings. Um, according to our local calendar, today is the uh, 27th day of Shabbat, which puts us on course from Ramadan beginning, inshallah, at the earliest on Wednesday. Um, I'd like to share some practical things with you today regarding the fast. And uh, firstly, I would like to uh, share with you a dua that Prophet would say when the Hilal of Ramadan was said. And again, this dua he would say signifying the beginning of the month of Ramadan. And this dua is reported by Qalha ibn Ubaidullah radiallahu anhu. It says that Prophet sallallahu alayhi would say whenever the Hiran for the holy month of Ramadan was cited. اللهم أهله علينا بالأمن والإيمان والسلامة والإسلام ربي وربك الله إلى رشد وخير. This hadith is reported by Imam Tirmidhi. So Prophet ﷺ would say upon the setting of the Hilal of Ramadan, O Allah, let Ramadan descend upon us with security, faith, peace, and submission. And again, this is a hadith reported by uh, an imam activity. The holy month of Ramadan is unique, as we well know, in many ways. And in many ways. And the reward that we can possibly receive for participating in the fast is unmatched. The Prophet ﷺ says that in, with regards to Ramadan, this is the Hadith of Qudsi where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says uh, that all of man's acts of devotion are for him. In the Sliyah, that all of the acts of devotion that man participates in are for him or for his benefit, except for one act, and that one act is fasting. And he says, li, Verily, fasting is for me, and I will reward for that act of devotion accordingly. What does that mean? The difference between fasting and the other acts of devotion, such as salah, such as salah, uh, zakah, you know, all of the other things, in which the possibility of that act being contaminated with mess. That act being contaminated with nafs, meaning that you, you're now doing something for someone else to see. That does not exist with fast. A person does not gain anything from anything personal like that where 
um, others could see. And the person would possibly modify or increase. There's no increasing your hunger. There's no increasing your thirst. If you're hungry, you're hungry. If you're thirsty, you're thirsty. That is the physical difference between fasting and these other acts of devotion. However, it's suggested that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that fasting is for me and I will reward for it accordingly. It's suggested, some of the scholars have suggested that fasting is the only act of devotion that is untouchable on the Day of Judgment. So when your asanas are present and you may or may not owe debts to other people, we know from the tradition that on the Day of Judgment, part of the accounting is the settling of debts. And that fasting is not one of those. Fasting is off limits because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the fasting of Ramadan in a special place. So a person could conceivably run out of good deeds and they still have their fasting of Ramadan. Can't take that from you. Can't touch that. That's in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the blessing of Ramadan. There are other hadiths with regards to the importance of the holy month itself. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Radiallahu anhu, Man sallam al-Rahmana 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 out of sincere faith and anticipation of reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him his previous sins. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy is setting up the table for us to do what? To benefit. This is his rahmah. This is his mercy that he offers us once a year the opportunity to make up for our shortcomings. And to go beyond that as well as inshallah we're going to discuss today. We all know that the first order of business when it comes to the fasting is the establishing of the day, beginning of the month by the study of the Hilal. And of course, once that's made, before you retire, you make your intention for your fast. So in the Madhab, that's what we do. So if you don't make your intention the night before, your fast for that day is invalid. So you make your intention the night before, and that intention will suffer. If you're fasting, your intention is to fast on Allah, you make your intention that night, and you're good to go. So it's not necessary for you to wake up every morning and, uh, I'm sorry, every night before you retire, you repeat that intention, that you intend to fast the following day. But on the one, is the month of mercies, the month of Quran. We're going to discuss that as well today, inshallah. But in order for us to be in a, a better position to be recipients of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and all of all that that entails, first thing is first. It suggested that we enter the, mo the month in the right way. Planning ahead. Make Tawbah before Ramadan comes. And we're going to make Tawbah every day during Ramadan because we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. So we're going to repeat, we're going to repeat this act periodically during the month. But before the month begins, we want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. We want to beg his forgiveness and we want to beg his mercy. 
And moving forward throughout the month, we want to do this periodically. We want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, to forgive us from or for things that we are aware of, things that we know we did, and things that we may have forgotten that we did. We want to ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to beg His forgiveness for all of our shortcomings, all of our flaws that we all know that we have. We want to seek out the best times for du'a. And we want to increase our du'a during the whole month. And we want to seek out the best times. And some of the best times are associated with our prayer. So when you're in sujood, you want to make du'a. Immediately after salah, Immediately after salah is a good time for you to make du'a as well. Fortunately for us, we get a lot of rain. When it's raining, we should make du'a as well. If we're in the habit, and during Ramadan, most of us are in the habit of spending a lot of time at night praying, you should make du'a the last third of the night. That's another good time for you to make dua. The ultimate goal from our fast should be to improve our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to strengthen that. And for us, that's a work in progress. That's something that we're doing all the time. It's not something that we're doing once. That's something that we're working at all the time. And one of the things that keeps you on point with that is making sure that one, you're making your salah on time, and it sounds elementary, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, in the salat wa muka. That if we are maintaining our salah and, and we're conscious during our salah, that is a deterrent for sin. You're focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that focus will keep you away from doing certain things. There's a hadith that I'm going to share with you today, and we'll get to that, but I don't want to get to that yet. But the hadith begins by Allah sallallahu alayhi wa saying that, As-salatu shakru iman. That salah is half of your faith. There's another hadith where the Prophet says, As-salatu imaduddin. That salah is the foundation of your faith. So if we're not praying, then, you, then what is your faith based on? So salah is extremely important. And this reminder isn't just for us. And I know we, we know people who struggle from time to time with things. And sometimes we struggle from time to time with things. And it's part of what benefits us is to remind others that we that we know that may be struggling, that that you know may have may may be experiencing doubt, that we offer that hand, offer that reminder is a hand. That's a hand of kindness and compassion. That we address our brothers and sisters in a merciful and a compassionate way. So our ultimate goal for Ramadan is to strengthen our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hopefully make up for uh, a lot of things that we've done in the previous year. So in addition to our obligatory salah, traditionally we try to participate in Tarawih prayer, we absolutely should do that. And there, there's reward as Prophet tells us that for every step that you take towards prayer is a form of sadaqah. You're giving sadaqah to yourself. You're being kind to yourself by doing things that will benefit your soul. So, although for most of us, 
Coming to the Masjid Lord of Ramadan for the Tarawih prayer will be a hardship because it's late. Aisha comes in after 10. And by the time we begin Tarawih, it's no earlier than 10.30. And we're done at midnight. And you're back up for supper at 3.30. And so some of us were up at 3 o'clock for supper. And then, you're, for a lot of us, you're, you're not taking a nap before you're up and about for work. But consider this. Consider Allah's mercy and His compassion. Consider His promise of forgiveness in your decision making. When you're weighing a couple of hours of rest versus Allah's mercy and His forgiveness. A couple of hours of rest versus every step that I take towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which me coming to Salah, taking steps towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I'm benefiting myself and understanding that when I do things that are of benefit to my soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies them at a minimum by 10 and Ramadan is a special time and as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said with regards to the fast in the month of Ramadan that the reward for that is increased so conceivably for every step is more than 10 rewards and depending on the, the distance between your residence and the masjid consider that when you're thinking about should I go or should I stay? Consider the reward. Consider the blessings. Consider the reward, the, the reward that you get for traveling in addition to the reward that you get for participating in Salat al Jama'ah, in addition to the reward that you will get for being in this blessed environment. An environment in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is being glorified. Consider all of this in your decision making. So, I encourage you to participate in Salat al Jama'ah during Ramadan as much as possible. Even if it's for two rakahs. Even if you've, you've said, you know, okay, I'm going to come to the masjid, but I'm going to, I am going to participate, but I'll stay for two rakah, four rakah, the first half. But don't rob yourself of that, that reward. Don't rob yourself, don't deny yourself that opportunity. Don't, don't deny yourself that opportunity. Another thing that we should focus on, which again, is of great benefit to us, which is dhikr. And dhikr comes in, in many forms, and you know, reading Allah's book is a form of dhikr, and we're going to talk about that. But having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your conscience regularly, and you do that by repeating his name, Repeating the names that you know. And if Allah is the only name that you know, repeat that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ahzab, Ya ayu al-lazina a'udhu billahi shaitan al-rajim, Ya ayu al-lazina a'udhu thukuru allaha, dhikran kathira. And you believe, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what? Often. And he puts it in the form of the command, or rather the imperative. You can look at it both ways. It's imperative for you, for your success, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often. Or you should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often. And we should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often. Because ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants nothing more for us than success. And he wants nothing more for us than for us to enjoy his mercy and his compassion. 
يا ايها الذين امنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوه بكره واصيلا ان غرفه هي مورنينج اند نايت هو الذي يصلي عليكم وملائكته ليخرجكم من الظلمات الى النور الله سبحانه وتعالى is pulling for you he wants you to do the things that will benefit your soul So he's praying for you the angels are praying for you as well they are praying for you that you are successful so for us understanding that we have this type of support when we feel again going back to should i go should i stay should i say having done all of that having that consciousness and that awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is important because we want to get everything that Ramadan has to offer we want it because it's the ultimate reward wa allazi yusalli alaykum wa malaikatuhu liyukhrijakum min al-dhulumati ila an-nur wa kana bil mu'minina rahima and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what merciful to the believers and that verse is verse uh, 56 Surah, I'm sorry, verse 41 uh, and 42 from Surah, from Surah 33, which is Surah, surah Al-Hazab, or the Confederates. Reading the Quran, which is something that we also traditionally do, we read, attempt to read the entire Quran during the Holy Month. So read a juz or however much Quran we attempt to read. We should do this. But what we should not do is read the Quran without reflection. Meaning that I'm just going through the motions. Okay, I went through the Quran and I finished it. and we understand the reward for uttering each letter of the book, of the Quran and the reward uh, the reward associated with that but you want to make sure you want to make an honest attempt to connect with the Lord's book and the only way you are able to connect with the Quran is by doing what contemplating reflecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Sa'id which is surah 38 <coughs> and in surah 38 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and this is verse 29 a'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab that this is a scripture that we have revealed unto thee full of blessings that thee may ponder its revelations and that men of understanding may reflect the first thing that stands out in this ayah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the Quran is mubarak meaning that Quran is what what does mubarak mean the Quran is blessed we should understand from this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more we are engaged with Allah's book the more blessed we are the more barakah we will experience and you you gain barakah from many things your engagement with the Quran is a blessing he followed that up with li yadabbaru Tadabbur means to engage in deep thought and reflection. 
So when I'm reading the Quran and I'm reading these verses, I'm reflecting on what I'm reading and where I fit into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking of. How do I fit into this? So as I'm reading, for example, I'm reading Surah Al-Baqarah. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa al-a'udhu billahi shaitan al-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alif la'amim, dhalika al-kitab la rayba fihi hudan al-muttaqin. I read verse 2, and I stop there, and I'm reflecting. As a matter of fact, this is because when his companions, Rubwan Allahi alayhim, may Allah be pleased with all of them, this is what they would do. They would not move beyond an ayah until they understood what the ayah was speaking of and they attempted to apply it to their lives. Likewise, that, that's our goal and our objective. That during Ramadan, or always, when we read the Quran, our objective is to have a meaningful engagement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. So I'm reading, I'm reflecting, and I'm, again, I'm reflecting on my life and how this relates to me and where I'm at. So if I'm reading verse 2 from Surah Al-Baqarah, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the Qur'an and how there is no doubt in the Qur'an and that it's a guidance for those who are God conscious. What does that mean to me? And I do this as I move from verse to verse to verse where I have, where I'm having a meaningful engagement with Allah's book. لِيَدَّبَّرُ آيَاتِهِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَى Then he speaks of what? That men of understanding do what? They reflect. They reflect on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to them. So as we plan our reading for the month, even if we don't get beyond the first juz, that's fine. It is better for you to read one juz in Ramadan <coughs> with reflection as opposed to you reading the entire Quran and you've got nothing out of it. We should also remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our dhikr. Uh, so when we do our dhikr, part of our dhikr has to be praying for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the same surah, Surah 33, which is Surah al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكِتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Again, Surah 33, verse 56. Verily, Allah and His angels pray and send salutations from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, believers, Pray for him and sing your salutations. This is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to share with you a hadith in which the Prophet says, and this is when, well, this is what we do in our master view. And this is when, when we end our khutbah. We end our khutbah with a, a, a particular dua, and part of it is uh, uh, part of the dua are verses from the Quran. One of the verses that we reference every Friday is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm sorry, it's, it's the hadith, where, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, says, He who offers a single salutation or prayer for me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in return will pray for you ten times. مَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيَّ مَرَّةً صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ بِهَا عَشْرًا 
So for every time you say, Allahumma, salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamid majid. The Prophet taught his companions how to offer this prayer for him. So when we say in our salah as part of our tashahu, this is what he prescribed. They asked him, Allah Messenger of Allah, how do we do this? How do we sing salutations and how do we pray for you? He told them. And that's what we say in our salah. So that's a form of extent of praying for the Prophet and extending salutations. In addition to what we say uh, traditionally here in our masjid after salah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Abdika wa Rasulika al-Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Again, the reward. There's another version of this hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, not only will you resend, receive those ten prayers, for each prayer that you offer for the Prophet ﷺ, but that you will have ten sins erased from your record for every salah that you offer for the Prophet ﷺ. And then we have to remember it's Dua Ramadan. So Dua Ramadan, everything is magnified. So we want to remember the Prophet ﷺ during this blessed month as well. We also want to give more of ourselves. We want to increase our sadaqah, we want to increase our giving, we want to increase our acts of kindness. The hadith that I mentioned at the beginning, and I said that I was going to get back to it, is the following hadith. In which the Prophet ﷺ said, that purification is half of your faith. So you, I, you know, a Muslim is a clean person. So, tahur, which is purification, is half of your faith. Then he goes on to speak about something that we were just talking about, which is dhikr. Walhamdulillah tamla al nizan. Say Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah. Head weighs heavily in the scale. Then he repeat he repeats, he says, Wa subhanallah and glory be to Allah. Walhamdulillah and alhamdulillah again. The reward for those two phrases, Subhanallah and Alhamdulillah, will fill the space between heavens and the earth. And prayer is light. So when your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intact, you have clarity of purpose. You're not fumbling about trying to figure it out. You have clarity of purpose. وَالصَّلَاةُ نُورُ وَالصَّدَقَةُ burhan, And charity is proof of faith. وَالصَّدَقَةُ what? وَالصَّدَقَةُ burhan. Charity is proof of faith. What does that mean? That means that when you value something and you are willing to part with it, that is a demonstration that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more important to you than the material. When you are kind to others and you demonstrate that kindness to others through action, by doing for other people, that's a testament 
to your faith. وَالصَّدَقَةُ بُرْحَابٌ وَالصَّبْرُ ضِيَعٌ Patience is clarity. So when you are patient, you are able to see things through to the end. وَالْقُرْآنُ حُجَّةٌ لَكَ أَوْ عَلَيْكَ that the Qur'an is one of two things. It's either, this is for everyone. This isn't only for the person who memorizes the Qur'an. Because we all have access to Allah's book. We all have Allah's book in our possession. So the Prophet ﷺ tells us that the Qur'an is one of two things. It will either testify for you or against you. He ends this hadith with a profound statement. All people navigate life, everyday life. And you fall into one of two categories. Either You fall into one to a one of two categories. There is no in between. Either you are working to benefit your soul or Benefit your soul by doing what's right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a result you will be free from the hellfire or you're working against yourself and working towards that ultimate abode of the hellfire. So you're one of two. Everybody's one of two. Everybody is working towards something. So I'm either working towards Jannah or I'm working towards the hellfire and now. But a lot of what we talked about today, the Prophet speaks of in this one hadith. And it's interesting that he began with your physical. That tahur is half of your faith. Making sure, not only that I'm, 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 if I'm praying, then I have to take care of myself physically. I have to be clean in order to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he started with that and ended with our directions in life. In addition, we should also consider uh, feeding the faster. By hosting iftars at your home, inviting people, there's great reward for that. Prophet ﷺ mentions that a person that offers a meal for the person who fasts, even if it's not a complete meal. Even if you offered up a date, a single date, a single piece of fruit, that you will get the reward of fasting that night. You already made your fast, so alhamdulillah. But additionally, the same reward that that person that you're offering if fought to, you'll get their reward as well for fasting. When we look at this, brothers and sisters, I mean, the only thing that you can say is SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. His love is evident in His mercy and His compassion. His love is evident in the ways that we can earn His favor. If all I have to do is give you some food and I get credit for fasting an entire day, SubhanAllah, Subhanallah, if all I have to do is say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, 
And I get ten rewards for that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praying for me ten times. And possibly I have ten time, ten, ten sins erased from my record. SubhanAllah. How can we look at this other than being Allah's love, His compassion, and His mercy? How is it possible for us to view it any other way? Some of the things that we should, inshallah, cut back on. We should cut back on the outside influences. So, our televisions, we should cut off, at least during the day. Because you don't want to have, see, a lot of times when you have these outside influences, you have competing interests. Shaitan is selling you his agenda through that means. And you're working diligently to get everything you can possibly get out of your fast. So you don't want anything to mess with that. So if the TV is a distraction, turn it off. If your engagement with the internet is a, a distraction, turn it off. Turn it off. Get back to basics. Get your Quran. Get your translation. If you have a collection of, of hadith that you like, engage with that. Engage with a good book. Engage your Lord through dhikr. Remembering Him by sitting in seclusion, find a quiet place, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That does wonders, brothers and sisters. When you have peace and you have tra tranquility that descends upon you from you remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if you've tried it, you know what I'm talking about. When you have quiet, and you're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this, this calm comes down and you can feel it and it feels wonderful these are the things that we try to do to hopefully inshallah maximize the benefit of our, of our fast one of the other things that we should try to do is that we should try to reflect on the lives of the prophets A lot of these stories we read in the Qur'an. And often you can find this stuff in other books. Seek out these books and read these, these stories of the different prophets. We should try to avoid things that will decrease from the value of our facts, guarding our tongue. And, you know, the, the tongue does a lot of damage, more damage than we actually realize. And Prophet ﷺ classified the tongue as one of the things that most likely will land people in hellfire by the things that we say. So all of the things that we're supposed to avoid anyway, we should uh, be extra observant of them during the holy month of Ramadan. So conversations that we know lead to certain things we should try to avoid. Even if we know certain people that when we engage with them, they have a tendency to lure us into conversations where the conversation is baited and we already know what's coming if necessary <coughs> avoid those people so fasting is more than us going hungry so we're also avoiding 
this idle talk, which often leads to, for us, it leads to things that are harmful. So our tongues are fasting. So I'm not talking about things that are not beneficial to me. Rather, I'm feeding my soul by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the words that are coming out of my mouth most likely are related to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm reading his book. I'm remembering him. And in between regular conversations, yes. Other stuff, absolutely not. Avoid being baited. And most, a lot of times we, the people that we engage with the be they family members, we already know what types of conversations we have with our family, friends, associates. Avoid those kind of the conversations that will be troublesome for you. Likewise, you should avoid listening or hearing things or reading things that could be objectionable or even prohibited. If you are not fasting, avoid eating in public. So if you have a reason not to fast and you're thirsty, you're hungry, it's lunchtime, it's dinner time, it's 5 o'clock, 5.30 and you're out and it's dinner time, do not eat in public. No one should see a Muslim sipping on a soda or chowing down on a hoagie and during the day of Ramadan. Even if it's permissible for you to do so. Why? Ramadan has a sanctity which we call Hurma. You do not want to be viewed as someone who is openly violating the sanctity of the fast. Even if you have an excuse. And that's not to say that you can't eat. That's not to say that you can't drink. Drink, but do it behind closed doors. Do it in private. Do it in private. And this message, and a lot of times people do stuff because they don't know. This is something that we have, we have to pass on. People that we can talk to. So I'm not suggesting that you approach somebody on the street that you don't know and you remind them that it's Ramadan and that you don't need to do that because you might end up breaking your fast. I'm not suggesting that, you're doing, that you do that. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that you, you leave that person alone. However, if, if it's someone that you know, you absolutely, absolutely have to have that conversation with them in a compassionate way, in a respectful way. Because most times people don't know. I mean, a lot, you know, you drive down the streets of Philadelphia and you see people, people eating, drinking, smoking. You see it. And the, 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 the question is, uh, well, doesn't this person know that it's Ramadan and that you shouldn't be doing that? Well, nine times out of ten, the person doesn't know that. Doesn't know that I shouldn't be doing this in public. So the message is that we send, I don't want to be, you don't want to put your Muslim brothers and sisters in a position where I'm suspecting that you're breaking your fast. Because that's the message that's being sent. Or that a non-Muslim is looking at you and the message that you're sending is that, oh, I thought you guys were fasting. <clears throat> Why aren't you fasting? Well, I guess all Muslims don't have to fast during Ramadan. Well, I guess Muslims can drink during the day of Ramadan. Or I guess that, it, you know, it's every other day. Or whatever may be going through the person's mind. When it comes to 
preserving and obse observing the sanctity of the month, that's our duty and our responsibility. And in some Muslim countries, you can't get arrested for doing that, whether you're Muslim or not. <clears throat> so the standard is, Ramadan, nobody's eating in public, even if a non-Muslim is eating in public, and they know it's Ramadan, guess what? Sorry, you're under arrest. So for us, we want to have this level of consciousness when it comes to respecting Ramadan. Then you have the, because this is a, a problem in our community, I mean, we have to talk about these things. You know, traditionally before Ramadan you have you know, people trying to rush to get married because they're in a relationship in which, you know, they're not married. And if you know of somebody like this, I mean, this is a conversation, again, you need to have with these people. Get, get your life right. And you have to at least try. You want to be in a relationship, at least get married. But know that during Ramadan, you're, you, you have a dilemma. You have a dilemma. I mean, you're trying to offer, offer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this sincerity. And then it's, it's glazed in all of this haram and, and it, it doesn't work. So this type of conversation, we have those of us who know people who are in situations like this, this type of conversation we absolutely have to have. People aren't always going to listen to you. They're not always going to listen to you. They're not always going to take your advice. But at least you can say, I told you. That's wrong. I know it's wrong. I have to tell you that it's wrong. You may not know. You may be thinking that it's two separate things. But in reality, that impacts your fast. And you have to address that. Lastly, we should work on, there's a big part of our fast is maintaining your composure. Staying at a certain place. Not allowing yourself to engage with people in a way that may invalidate your fast by getting angry raising your voice and saying things that are objectionable. So these are things that we should try to do, inshallah, during uh, the blessed month. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accept from us all, that he make this Ramadan one, a blessed one, and two, one in which we gain much benefit. Now, there are questions regarding some of the rulings. We can um, ask those now. If you have questions in general, you can ask those questions as well. Yes? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, like next Friday, I'm supposed to get a cortisone shot in my knee. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean that I'm going to break my fast by getting that cortisone shot? According to the madhab, no. You, if, uh, uh, injections do not invalidate your fast. So you are allowed to get an injection. Yes? Hey man, she mentioned that <coughs> on your way traveling to the masjid can you receive blessings. Yes. And do you have to be even wounded to receive those blessings? No. You don't? No. Absolutely not. So even if you're, you're, in, you're in route to the master, from the time you leave your home to the time you reach your destination, and it's, it, you know, the Prophet ﷺ mentions for every step, but even if you're in your car, you're, it's, it's, the reward is the same. If you're on a bus, if you're driving, if you're riding a bike, whatever, it, the reward is the same. And you, you absolutely do, you don't have to be in, in the world for that. Because again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rewarding your intention. 
Yes. Well, you said if you feed a, a person that's fasting, what about a street person? No, the, the comment that I made was with regards to if talk. So, yes, it, it's not the same. So your offer, if, if the street person is Muslim and they fasted that day, absolutely. But if they're not Muslim, then you won't receive the, the same. You'll receive a general reward for giving someone sadaqah. But you won't receive the reward of fasting that day unless you're feeding, you're giving, or you're providing a thought for someone who uh, had fasted that day. Okay, anyone else? Yes? Claudia has a question, but he doesn't have an Okay. He said when you first step in the match, you get 10 months. Uh, yes. When you cross the threshold and you say the du'a, absolutely. And even if you don't say the du'a, you still get blessings for coming, for crossing the threshold. What du'a are you supposed to say? Uh, Allahumma ftahli abu abadhanatik. Which means, oh Allah, open the, the doors of your garden to me when you enter uh, into the masjid. Yes. So, when you said that if you offer someone even a date, you get a reward for that, but that's a date purchase, right? For that same type of reward. You said, is that a, a, a date purchase? Purchase. Yes. Yes, because it's something that's coming from you. I mean, so. So, a person that find that, you know, there was food on the table, and then it thought, and I picked up the food and I walked it over to you. No, you, no, because that's not your food. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, that that see, then that goes back to the whole sadaqa thing. That goes back to the whole sadaqa thing. So that's coming. That's coming from you. That's that's your your country. That's your charity that that you're giving. So simply picking up a plate off the table and transporting it from point A to point B, no, you get a, you get you get reward for you know trans transportation. I mean that's about it. But you're not getting credit for fasting that day. Nor are you the sadaqa that you which is sadaqa. Now we understand because you know the concept of sadaqa is is vast. So, a person is sitting, you get up, you go, go get a plate. That's a kindness. And you get reward for that. And that's a form of sadaqah. But is it the same as, you know, I purchased this, and I brought it to you, and I gave it to you to, to break your fast with? They're not the same. So, these are two different types of kindnesses. Yes? Hmm? So how does that work like in your household? So let's say you you know, your family buys food and whether you fast it or you didn't fast, you provide food for like you go, you you know, provide the, the things for everybody to break fast or would that be more of a thought or would that be more if of a it is your intention to provide if thought for someone who is fasting, absolutely. So by that I mean the person that purchased the goods for the iftar so that you can have something to break your fast with, rewarded. The person that prepared, prepared the meal for the person to eat, rewarded. So, I mean, again, the beauty in this is subhanAllah. I mean, even when you are doing for your own family, when you're doing for your own family, but you have to have the niyyah. You have to have the intention and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be reward you accordingly. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum. Wa when you um, open up and mention about your intention to fast, did I get you correct when you used to say you can just make your intention for that one night before and it carries through the whole For the entire month, yes. Okay. 
Yes. Do you have to say the entire month? No, 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 no. See, again, let's go back to the whole concept of That's intention. Yeah, you, no. See, when you the, the whole concept of intention is when, when a person makes their intention, it's not nece it's not necessarily something that you say. I know that Ramadan begins tomorrow. I intend to fast the entire month. That's your niyyah. Right. So when when by, by me saying I intend to fast the entire month, you don't have to say that. Okay. Ramadan is tomorrow. I know that Ramadan is tomorrow. Inshallah, my intention is to fast the month of Ramadan. You're good. So for every day you wake up, you wake up for Sahrul, and your, in, your intention carrying from the beginning of the month is to fast 29 or 30 days. Is that based on different schools of thought? Yeah, so as a matter of fact, there's even ikhtilaf in the madhab with regards to whether or not um, you should make your intention the night before every, every day or whether or not once is sufficient and once, once, once is sufficient. Everybody isn't going to always remember, you know, because if you forget, you fall asleep, oh my God, I fell asleep and now, you know, I have to make up that day. I mean, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعَسْرَ Allah wants ease for you. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, يَسِّرُ وَلَا تُعَسِّرُ وَبَشِّرُ وَلَا تُنَفِّرُ that we should make things easy for people, not hard. And we should remind people of Allah's mercy, love, and compassion, and not His wrath, more than we do of His wrath. So what should, what should come from us, we should be easy on one another, we, we should provide ease, and we, we have to remind each other of Allah's mercy and His compassion. And we, sh we shouldn't be quick to say, well, you're going to hell, or you're going to be punished for that, or, you know, you, 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 you. Because most often, a person that's doing wrong already knows that they're wrong. And, they are, and they have, if they have an ounce of consciousness, they already, they already feel bad. I don't need to add to that. What I need to do is remind them that the door for rahmah or forgiveness is <coughs> always open. That's what I need to do. I don't need to remind them uh, you're going to hell because you're doing this or, you know. I don't mean, yeah, they already know that. What I do need to remind them of is Allah's mercy is there, always. Yes. Me? Mm -hmm. Okay, for well, a person who is not going to fast because of illness, they know they're not going to fast. Mm-hmm. At one point, I was under the impression that you could just call a whole bunch of people together and feed them and you make up for your fast. But I was told last year that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. People have to be of a certain need. Mm -hmm. So, these people that you do feed but if taught and you get the rewards of fasting, mm -hmm. is that the same? Does that make up for the sick person? No. No, that, that doesn't okay. because those are two totally different I, things. I didn't think so. One, one is voluntary and optional, which is, you know, me providing a thought for someone. The other is an obligation and a requirement which um, entails some hardship on my part, meaning that um, I can't... Uh, provide a thought for a bunch of people and that be considered as my um, my kafara or my expiation for missing the day or however many days that I missed because um, one, the person has to be in need and everyone present most likely isn't in need like that um, uh, and the other issue is that uh, you're supposed to feed one person per day. So the, effort, the repetitive, uh, repetitive effort is part of what you're supposed to do, not, you know, 30 days, okay, here you go. <coughs> Everybody, yeah. <laughs> yes. What is the first angel the person 
The age? Yes. Well? Of when the person has to start dancing. When the person is obligated to fast is between 13 and 15. Now, that, that doesn't mean that when uh, mom or dad says that you're fasting when you're uh, 8 or 9 that you have an option. So you, you can discuss that with mom and dad. Okay, possum, then I'm out, and then uh, call it. Yes, possum. What do you say when you make an intention of this? You don't have to say anything. But you have to know that Ramadan starts the next day and that you're going to fast that next day. Okay. Amal? Uh, can Christians and Christians can fast, but they won't receive the reward for fasting. Why won't they? Because they're not Muslim. And they're not Muslim. Only Muslim? Only Muslim? Actually, everyone is supposed to fast. Likewise, everyone is supposed to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you fast when you are a baby? No, I think that would be too much for a baby to fast. Does everybody know yeah. what happened? Yes, it's an idea. Um, technically you could do that because the people that um, are being fed are people who are genuinely in need. But is that the best thing to do? No. Because again, basically you're eliminating a couple of the steps. Mainly the preparation and the delivery. So the preparation is fine because a person could go and buy, you know, our prepared food and, and give that. That's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But, you know, the giving, um, the actual delivery is something that, that you, you, you should do. Yeah. I'm sorry? Can a toddler fast? Can a, can a toddler fast? Um, I think they can, but I think it would be really hard. They may fast like an hour or two, but that's about it. I don't think they could fast a whole day. I think that would be too much. Yes, Bobby. Do you have to fast? Muslims have to fast, yes. What if they were sick? I'm sorry, what if they were sick? Yes. People who are sick don't have to fast. All right. Anyone else? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry, I had this question before their whole hiring question started. So if a, let's say um, someone is uh, planning to fast, they make their intentions at the beginning of Ramadan to fast, and for whatever reason they are, they're unable to fast because their sister who's, you know, if she can't fast or a person becomes sick. When that time passes, do they need to remake that intention or is that initial inten intention still applied to the moment? I'm sorry, I need you to repeat that. <laughs> so let's say at the beginning of Ramadan, Someone make their intentions, and night before Ramadan comes in, saying that they're going to fast the month of Ramadan. Yeah. But then something kind of halts their fasting. It could be a sister who's not in Salat, or someone, you know, with a temporary illness, or something, whatever the case may be. And then that period stops, and they resume fasting again. Do they have to restate their intention? They should reestablish their intention, yes, to complete the month. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Down any other questions? Inshallah, we will close with dua. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Thank you everyone for coming out. Inshallah, 
I will see some of you, inshallah, if not most of you, um, uh, either Tuesday or Wednesday night. Uh, we'll have a confirmation for the Taraweeh prayer.